Hello. I'm Virginia Moxley, the Dean of the College of Human Ecology, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 39th Grace Shugart Lecture. This is an amazing lecture series, and I am so proud that this year we welcome back one of our own as our speaker. I'm going to turn this podium over to Jeannie Sneed, who is head of the Department of Hospitality Management and Dietetics, and Dr. Sneed will make more introductions of some very special guests and of our speaker. Welcome to all of you. This is going to be great. Thank you very much, Dean Moxley. On behalf of the faculty of the Department of Hospitality Management and Dietetics, I would like to add my welcome to Dean Moxley's welcome. I also have the pleasure of introducing some special guests to you. Um, first with, that I would like to introduce is Mr. Jeffrey Shugart and his wife, Joanne. And Jeffrey is the grandson of Grace Shugart. And we feel very honored that they take time out of their busy schedules to come every year as a tribute to uh, uh, Jeff's grandmother. So we appreciate that effort and we enjoy your visit each year. I would like to also introduce two of our emeritus faculty members from the department, Dr. Faith Roach and uh, Mrs. Sue Gregg. And Thank you all for coming and, and your ongoing support. We also have several members of our Dietetics Advisory Board who met this morning. And tomorrow morning, we'll have our Hospitality Management Advisory Board. And so would all of the members of those two boards please stand and we can recognize your ongoing time commitment and contributions to our departments. Thank you very much and we appreciate your uh, attending and, and joining us today. When I thought about all of the people that we needed to recognize, I think the most important group are the group of students that we have here. And so I'd like to welcome you because really it was because of students that this lecture series was started. Mrs. Shugart was very dedicated to educating students and to providing them with uh, opportunities to learn more about exciting opportunities in their field. And so for 39 years, we have been able to offer the lecture series and hopefully add some enrichment to the lives of our students. So welcome to all the students in the room. The Sugar Lecture Series began in 1975 as a tribute to Grace M. Sugart when she retired as the head of dietetics, restaurant, and institutional management. Mrs. Sugart was a prominent national leader in food service management and dietetics. She was a former president of the American Dietetic Association, and she was a COFER Award winner, which is the highest award given to a member of the dietetics uh, profession. She co-authored books like Food for 50 and Food Service and in Institutions. Grace Sugar really left a legacy for the profession, for Kansas State University, and certainly for our department. And so it's a, a great honor to be here today for the Sugar Lecture. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mary Gregoire. Dr. Gregoire is the Director of Food and Nutrition Services at Rush University Medical Center and Professor and Chair of Clinical Nutrition at Rush University. Operationally, she directs a $19 million Food and Nutrition Services operation with a staff of 260 employees, including 50 professional staff. So she has a big operation. She has served as chair of the Rush Green Team, co-chair of the Building Standards Committee for the new LEED Gold Certified Hospital Bed Tower, 
which is the largest new construction healthcare project in the world to be LEED Gold certified. And she's championed many sustainability initiatives at Rush. Dr. Gregoire has been a leader in the field of dietetics and hospitality management. And perhaps a few students will recognize her name as the author of Food Service Organizations, A Managerial and Systems Approach. And I believe that you use that in at least one class and perhaps many, and I see a few nodding heads. So it's fun to actually see and meet and hear someone who writes textbooks that you use in your classes. Um, as Dean Moxley said, we're also very proud that she's a K-State alum. She finished her PhD in, can I say the year? She and I finished our PhDs the same year, uh, 1985. And so uh, she's had a long and illustrious career in the field. So please join me in welcoming the 39th Grace Sugart Lecturer, Dr. Mary Gregoire, who will talk about sustainability and how we can lead change and what the opportunities are. Dr. Gregoire. Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. It is such an extreme honor to be here. I thank Dean Moxley for her welcome. I thank Dr. Sneed uh, for her kind words, and I'm just so very pleased to be here. Um, I enjoyed the opportunities of the Grace Schugert Lectures while I was here as a student, and so I'm extremely honored to be here as one of those. I was very fortunate to come to K-State to work on my PhD. Uh, K-State has long been known for its excellence in food service management and I received an outstanding degree while I was here. I want to take a moment to recognize several who are in the audience who played a very instrumental role. <laughs> Many of you should be able to see your photos here in this. Uh, Dr. Faith Roach, Dr. Janice Dana, Dr. Deb Cantor were all on faculty while I was here and helped uh, further my understanding of the theory that is involved in food service management. Mr. John Pence, Dr. Mary Moult, Mr. Pat Pacey, Ms. Mally Sisson were all leaders in campus dining operations while I was here. Mrs. Linda McGuire was the food service director at what was then St. Mary's Hospital. They all helped me better understand what excellence in food service operations looks like. Dr. Carol Shanklin, as you know, is a pioneer in the area of sustainability research and had a lot of influence on some of the research that I've since done in that area. And Dr. Jeannie Sneed has provided guidance and has furthered my research abilities along the way. And to all of them, I say thank you. All of you who know me also know that I have an extremely supportive family as well, and I need to take a few minutes to recognize them. My husband Wayne uh, allowed us to move to Manhattan years ago and has supervised many moves uh, since then as, as my career shifted us across the country. Uh, he's always done way more than his fair share around the house, as anyone who knows us at all knows. Uh, but is always ready to organize a party. This one being a big, any of you that were here in the 80s, the big graduation or the uh, graduate student picnic in the fall that was held in the park. Our daughter Teresa grew up here in the old Jardine apartments. Uh, I think she started school assuming that every child's bedroom was converted to a dining room as hers had been for many years. And our son Jonathan was born here in Memorial Hospital and became a wildcat very early in life. I also had the opportunity to know Mrs. Shugart, and I didn't realize that Sue would be here as well, but Sue Gregg is in this photo as well. Um, I, I had the opportunity to know Mrs. Shugart while I was here, and I think the thing that impressed me the most was her uh, stressing of the importance of linking what goes on in the classroom with what goes on in operations, that practical, hands-on combined with classroom. And so I will try to share a little of that linkage as well in my comments today. Sustainability is a topic that is very important to me and it's really rather fitting that this presentation would occur in this particular week. As you know, Monday was Earth Day. 
I know you had many celebrations here on campus and events uh, in the community as well, helping reinforce the importance of sustainability and some of the kinds of things that we need to be doing to help protect our environment. During my short time with you today, I asked Dr. Sneed how long I could talk. She really felt like you might not stick with me much more than an hour, so I'll try and keep it to that. You know, I'll, any who know me know I could talk on for hours. But today, what I want to spend a little time on is to share, at least from my perspective, some definitions around what sustainability is, why it's important, what companies are doing to address sustainability, and then particularly what kinds of things we're seeing done in our industries to look at the topic of sustainability. And then finally to talk about what we can do to lead change in this area. So let's start with some background about what is sustainability. This is a definition from the EPA that defines from their perspective what sustainability is. I might highlight just a few phrases out of this definition that I think tie together what's so critical. First of all, this idea of humans and nature being able to exist in some form of harmony. Secondly, the fact that sustainability has a social and an economic component to it. And finally, the concept of present and future generations being involved in this process. The EPA's definition and their work then goes on to talk about sustainability in the built environment, in our water, ecosystems and agriculture, in air, climate and energy, and then materials and toxics. And I will try and cover each of those briefly in my comments today. Actually, the definition that I like a little better is one by a Dr. David McCloskey, who's a sociology professor at Seattle University. And he talks about sustainability more directly related to behaviors, and I think his work gives us some guidance in what sustainability should look like. So he indicates that actions are sustainable if there's a balance between the resources that are used and the resources that are regenerated. That resources are as clean or cleaner at the end use as at the beginning. The viability, integrity, and diversity of natural systems are restored and maintained. These actions are sustainable if they lead to enhanced local and regional self-reliance, they help and maintain community and a sense of, of place. And that each generation re, re, um, preserves the legacies for future generations. The focus in all of these definitions really is on our natural capital and what we can do to help um, focus on the soil, the air, the water, the environment um, for the plants, animals, creatures that live in this ecosystem. So with that brief then definition, I'd like to talk a little bit about why it's important, why we need to be concerned. So first we'll start with some facts just generally here in the United States. As some of you may know, uh, the United States is only about 5% of the world's population, yet we use about 26% of the world's energy. We use 100 to 150 gallons per person per day of water. And we waste about 4.4 pounds per person per day, which if you do your math in your head, results to over 1,000 pounds per person per day. About a fourth of that uh, waste is actually recycled or composted. We are big users of energy and that use of energy has really exponentially grown in the last century, um, particularly our use of non-renewable resources, oil, coal, natural gas. And our generation have, of waste has more than doubled in the last 30 years. Uh, we now dispose of nearly 250 million tons of waste in a year. So then let's talk a little bit about our industry and what's going on in our industry. The energy use in the hospitality industry uh, is um, estimated to be about 2.5 times 
as much as other commercial industries. Uh, that's in part because of the heating, uh, ventilation, air conditioning, the HVAC. Uh, that's a large component in hotels and, and still a major component in restaurants. As well as, in the case of hotels, the heating of hot water, the preparation of food in our restaurants. This gives some indication of the amount of water that we use in our operations. Hotels go through about 100 to 200 gallons a day per occupied room. Schools go through about five gallons a child per meal. Restaurants go through about 10 gallons a meal. And in waste, we also are big generators of waste. Hotels, it's estimated, um, generate two to four pounds per room per day, and restaurants about one pound per seat per day. All of this also then is related when we talk about sustainability and feeds into concerns around climate change and what is going on. This is a, a graph that was taken from the uh, National Oceanic um, and Atmospheric um, Organization. And in their work they show, this shows the uh, rate of temperature change since the early 1900s. Uh, the year 2001 to 2010 was the warmest decade on record worldwide. So I think you've all experienced some of those warming trends that have gone on. We really see this when you look at pictures like this, the photos of the Arctic ice cap and the decrease that we've seen in that space. We've also experienced it in the dramatic changes we've seen in climate. Uh, the drought that you all experienced here in Kansas as well as across the Midwest the, this past year. Between 2000 and 2011, roughly 30 to 60 percent of the land in the U.S. experienced drought conditions at any one point in time in the last 10 years. Conversely, we've had heavy rains. The flooding that we had in Illinois and are still actually experienced as we travel here, uh, the flooding you had here in Manhattan a couple years ago um, and across the country. Nationwide, eight of the top 10 years for extreme one-day precipitation have occurred since 1990. And we've seen the impact, uh, the increase in, and the devastation created by severe storms, such as Hurricane Sandy. Seven of the busiest Atlantic Ocean hurricane seasons in the past 160 years occurred in the past 10 years. I hope you will agree with me that these data do provide some evidence that we do need to look at this issue of sustainability, that there is work that needs to be done. So how are companies addressing this concern? An important shift, I think, has been the redefinition of a company's bottom line, moving from just a focus on financial performance to a more holistic approach that includes uh, the people and the planet as well, sort of the, the um, social as well as um, sustainability issues. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Spreckley was the first to really talk about this idea back in 1981. He published a paper on social audit and he talked about the fact that enterprises should measure and report on social, environmental, and financial performance. And then I think this concept gained a lot of ground after the book came out by Savage and Weber in 2006 called The Triple Bottom Line, where they reinforced this need for companies to take a look at all of these and stress the importance of considering profits in light of and concurrent with environmental and social performance. The traditional model in our companies often has been what has been termed take, make, and waste. In the 1970s, researchers at the U.S. Midwest Institute began looking at ways to change that and encourage companies to take a more life cycle approach, as they termed it, to what was going on within their organizations to assess what goes on environmentally from the start of the process through the end of the process. This is an example of a life cycle analysis that is performed at Procter & Gamble that starts with them uh, looking at some of the environmental impacts of the kinds of chemicals that they're using as their raw materials 
and focuses in, on looking at environmental impacts all the way through the process to the end where their waste is disposed. This life cycle analysis has often been termed a cradle to grave approach in looking at the life cycle of a product. In 2002, uh, McDonough and Brongart actually published a book called Cradle to Cradle. And in their book, they stressed that this cradle to grave approach really did not take things far enough, that that life cycle approach really needed to be taken further. And, and they termed it a more complete cycle. So that not only did we need to look at that cradle to grave approach, that life cycle from when we extract our natural resources through the economic activity to the waste, but in fact we needed to look at what happens to that product at the point that it may not have a, any additional useful life and where does that go. As they see it, we should stop trying to do bad things less badly as they termed it, and instead start doing things that are intrinsically better for the environment. I think business leaders have begun to realize the importance and the value of sustainability um, as they're doing strategic planning and looking at operations and looking at what could we do to improve operations. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on within our industry and what types of things we're doing. One of the big shifts has started with the increased focus on building design and the kinds of things that go into putting a building together. The U.S. Building Council several years ago created what they call LEAD, uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, which are standards for buildings as they're being um, designed, constructed, and then lived in. Uh, LEED offers certification at several levels, platinum being the highest, gold, and silver. And those categories are actually based on sort of four core areas. The first is sustainable site. They look at what kinds of things are being done to impact uh, the environment based on the site and the design of the building. They look at water efficiency, and that focuses on what kinds of things are being done to help conserve and reduce the amount of water that's used. They look at energy and atmosphere, what kinds of things are being done to conserve energy to reduce the use of energy in the building. They look at the materials and resources that are used both to build the building as well as to equip the building once it's been built. And they look at indoor environmental quality and what kinds of things are being done to enhance that quality. Earning platinum certification is huge. Uh, these are some examples within our industry of restaurants, hotels, schools, hospitals that have actually built and earned LEED platinum certification. Even bigger is for an entire city to work towards having nothing but platinum buildings in the city. I know many of you are from the state of Kansas. You'll remember the devastating tornado that went through Greensburg, Kansas in 2007, basically destroyed 95% of that community. And as community leaders got together to talk about how they wanted to rebuild, what was going to be important in the rebuilding, they made the commitment to try and create a model green city and having as many buildings as possible be LEED Platinum certified. And so these are examples from our, the school, the hospital, the motel in town, all have received that certification for their buildings. And of course I need to share a little bit about what we've been doing at Rush. This is the, the bed tower that Jeannie talked about, our um, 806 square foot, 14 story bed tower that we opened uh, just a year ago that is LEED Gold certified. And I have to say kudos uh, to K-State Dining. We stopped at JP's last night and I noticed that they are LEED Gold certified as well. Um, some of the kinds of things that we did at Rush to try and meet the LEED certification. Uh, for under sustainable site, we have green roofs, so over half of our footprint was returned to natural vegetation um, because of our green roofs. We collect the rainwater so that rainwater does not actually come off of the tops of our buildings and go down into the sewage system. 
Uh, we offer reduced fees, parking fees, and give designated spots for hybrid cars. We did reduced exterior lighting for water. We uh, actually designed a, a rather unique cooling system in which the condensate that comes off the air conditioning is actually flowed back into the cooling towers. So instead of using totally fresh water in the cooling towers. And then we did things that I know you see in a lot of places, the low flush toilets, um, the low flow showers, uh, as well as collecting that water uh, from the roof to be used then to water those green roofs that we have. For energy, we put in energy efficient HVAC systems. We did reflective siding. Uh, we have censored lighting in the patient room. So every room has outdoor light, has natural lighting coming in from big windows, floor to ceiling windows. And the lighting in those rooms is actually controlled. So on bright sunny days, the lighting does not need to come on at all. On grayer days, then the amount of lighting gets adjusted or as evening comes, the lighting adjusts based on the amount of natural light that's coming in. We use recycled steel and concrete in the building of the hospital and then recycle uh, more than 95% of the construction waste that we had. We use FCS wood, we use furniture with recycled content. Uh, we made the commitment that everything that went into the hospital um, that we could purchase within a radius, we used 250 miles as our regional radius uh, was purchased from those sources. For the indoor environmental quality, we use things like the low VOC paint, sealants, uh, adhesives. We did increase the air exchanges that went on in the building and put in no wax floors. I was very fortunate, as, as Dr. Sneed had indicated, I served actually as the co-chair of our building standards committee, which had set a lot of the standards that went on. And so it was really um, interesting and rewarding to be engaged in conversations to really be looking at what are some of the things that are going on out there and what kinds of things could we put into rush to make it um, as good as we could do. So now let's talk a little bit about sustainability and daily operations in our field. Sustainability practices for us uh, fall into both the purchasing practices as well as our operational practices. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about our sourcing of food because that's often something particularly on the food service side of our business that um, there's a lot of discussion about what we can do to make that more sustainable. Uh, three terms that you often see used and, and sometimes used interchangeably are sustainably grown, organically grown, and locally grown. Those terms do differ and I want to talk a little bit about the differences in those terms. This is a definition that uh, the USDA had in the 1990 Farm Bill around sustainable and what, what it means to be sustainably grown. And it sort of has three prongs to it. It has the environmental stewardship piece that focuses on the soil quality, the water quality, the kinds of materials that are being used um, in, in farming practices. But it also has a focus on providing more profitable farm income and promoting stable and prosperous uh, farms and small communities. So it has that local um, piece to it. There are a number of companies, uh, third party companies who will do certification of products as to whether or not those products are sustainable. Some of these you may have seen on some of the products that you've purchased. Organically grown was actually defined under the Organic Food Production Act in 2002. Um, it stipulates that for a product to be identified as organically grown, that it has to meet several standards in the actual production process. Uh, some things related to the plant and animal health, the kinds of products that can and cannot be used, um, how we manage pests, um, and how we uh, use non-renewable resources in that process. Organic is actually uh, controlled by the government. There's a government certification process. And so in order to be able to say that your product is organic, certified organic, there is a government inspector that will come out, look at farm records, do an actual farm evaluation. 
And then those products actually need to be tracked from the point of the farm to the final sale at the point to the consumer. Products that meet those guidelines and certifications then can carry the USDA certified organic seal. Locally grown products tend to come from a fairly um, closed in geographical area. Uh, there isn't a clear definition. Often what you'll see used is 100 miles from the point of sale. One of the unique things I think with locally grown is they're more often sold in, in some alternate sorts of, of channels to the consumer um, through farmers markets, CSAs, pick your own, roadside stands. Uh, although we're starting to finally see more of that occurring with our major food vendors as well in them contracting with farmers to be able to provide those to organizations. This all leads to this idea of food with a face. I couldn't resist this photo. I thought it was so good. So I thought it would brighten you up here in the middle of the talk. But this is actually the concept of food with a face. It's that idea of really getting to know who it is that's producing, growing the products that you're eating. And so having pictures that might identify that farmer. We're seeing a lot more use of locally grown in our schools as well. The USDA supported farm to school program has increased the use of locally grown and has prompted the starting of a lot of school gardens. I want to thank Barb Dupuy at the State Department here in Kansas, as well as uh, Denise Sh Sh Scribner, excuse me, and Judy Magner, who provided me these pictures of some of the projects that are going on here in Kansas at some of the schools, some of the garden projects, as well as greenhouse projects that have been built and that food is now being used in the schools. States are also very active in the locally grown and doing things to market products that were grown in their state and have logoing that, that ranchers and farmers can use to identify their products. The important message I'd like you to take away from this portion in talking about the food supply is that sustainably grown, organically grown, and locally grown are different terms and mean different things. Sustainably grown may or may not be organically grown, but typically is locally grown. Organically grown follows sustainable agricultural principles, but may or, not, may or may not be locally grown. And locally grown may or may not be either sustainably or organically grown. And so as a food service director procuring product, it's important to realize the difference of these so as you market what it is that you're selling, you've got a good sense of the difference. This is always interesting to get huh? in the middle of your talk. Let's see if it shuts it out. So let's look talk then a little bit about some purchasing practices that you're seeing in our operations. One of those is this shift from use of styrofoam to the use of either recyclable plastics or biodegradable compostable products. Uh, we shifted away from styrofoam a number of years ago and I will say that the products today, the compostable products are much better than the original. Uh, you can vision yourself coming to my cafeteria, buying a baked potato with chili or mashed potatoes and gravy or a cup of soup, taking it back to your desk, sitting down, working, eating. And a while later, you go to throw that empty container away, and lo and behold, there's a puddle on your desk. Well, any of you who know about the composting process know that composting uh, works with heat and moisture. And so these early compostable ware did start composting right there on your desk. But <laughs> they have gotten better and, um, and do allow for that product to be pulled into a different waste stream, to actually be able to be pulled out, run in a composting waste stream, not ending up in the landfill. 
We're seeing a lot of things happen with paper products. You're much more likely to see sort of dispensed, um, individually dispensed napkins, paper towels, instead of getting the handfuls when you pull, it's a very preset amount. Often those paper products are made with recycled paper. I think one of the uh, great examples of how you can engineer waste out of a system is what's gone on, at least institutionally for us, in, in toilet paper. You know, traditionally when we would buy toilet paper, it came with a cardboard tube in the middle and it was wrapped in paper inside of plastic, inside a box. And we've since done away with the cardboard tube. We don't individually wrap those rolls of toilet paper. But it's things like that that we need to continue to look at as, as ways that we can reduce what's in the system. A relatively new um, piece that we're seeing in the industry is this focus on being able to recycle material. They've developed processes now where polyester can actually be recycled. And so you're seeing uh, linens, towels, uniforms that are made both with recycled polyester and which at the end of their useful life can be turned back into and turned back in so that companies can recycle that. It gets back to that cradle to cradle approach that I talked about earlier, being able to look at a product that you're producing and saying what is going to happen to it at the end of its useful life and can we do something to prevent that being um, dumped in a landfill being what happens at the end of its useful life. There's a lot of things that can be done within the cleaning as well. We're seeing more of a resurgence back to using uh, regular cloth rags instead of disposable rags, using microfiber uh, cloths inst and mops instead of the traditional cotton that will take on less water, use less water, the use of concentrated chemicals that, that uh, reduces the amount of packaging uh, that we have. Uh, there's two different organizations. The USDA has a bio preferred certification that they give for green chemicals. There's also a company called Green Seal that's done a lot of certifying of green chemicals. Purchasing practices, um, we're seeing things like pulpers, which will reduce the volume of waste, um, sometimes up to 80%. Uh, the purchase of Energy Star equipment, you not only see that in the home, but you also see that going on in institutions as well. Um, one of the newer features on our dish machines are the heat recovery units that we're seeing where they actually pull some of that heat that's being exhausted off of the drying end uh, and that goes back in to heat the, the wash and rinse water. Uh, as well as controls on the venting system so that our vents don't run full bore the whole time we're in operation but yet it's more controlled by the heat that's being generated. Um, I've done several research projects that have looked at operating practices both in hospitals as well as college and universities. Dr. Rita Chen was a graduate student I worked with at Iowa State and Miss Elisa Wang was a graduate student at Rush. And what we found in our operations actually was very similar in hospitals and colleges and universities. The most common things that are being recycled are fat, oil and grease, cardboard, recycled paper products and then recycling aluminum. The least common practices were using the local or organically grown foods and the use of composting. How many of you have seen uh, this symbol, this reduce, reuse, recycle? You know, it provides good guidance, I think, for us as we look at our operations and some of the kinds of things that we can do. And you're seeing a lot of practices that have been launched to try and address this. So, for example, dining halls have gone to trayless dining so that it reduces the amount of food that's being taken and ultimately wasted. We have reusable beverage uh, cup programs that prompt us to, to reuse cups instead of disposable. Um, Hotels are asking us to not uh, have our linens cleaned every day, but in fact to use our linens, our towels, and our bed sheets um, multiple days. And then the active recycling and composting programs that are going on. Education, I think, is often one of the biggest challenges in our work to try and, and broaden what happens in our operations sustain sustainably. How many of you saw this sign here on campus? Anybody recognize this sign? 
This was a research project that was done in Van Zyl just a year or two ago. I don't know, the signs may still be up. I didn't think to ask that before I got started. But what it showed, um, Dr. Whitehair, Shankland, and, and Brannon had done a project to look at you know, what kind of messaging best helps prompt behaviors. And just a simple sign such as this actually reduced the waste that was generated by 15% in Van Zyl. At Rush, I've been involved in a lot of different initiatives to try and educate. We developed a logo around our um, initiative. We have a website. We handed out bookmarks that had information about our program and the website information. We've had flyers that talk about what is and isn't recyclable and what bin it goes in. We developed an online quiz to try and, and correct some of the bad behaviors we had, the things that were getting thrown in the wrong bins. Uh, we handed out bags at one of our um, Earth Day events that had what was recyclable printed on the side of the bag. And then we have routine letters in both our online and our printed newsletters. So now comes what I would call our call to action. What can we do to try and change and provide leadership in sustainability? This is a, a sort of a graphic of the information that comes out of the EPA. And they suggest where we need to start is trying to prevent as much as possible what is going to go in the landfill. We can do that by composting our organic waste, any of the products that can be composted, diverting waste, and that may mean diverting food to shelters or for use as animal feed, recycling the products that we can recycle. But one of the biggest things that we can do is to try and reduce waste in the first place, to try and get back to the source and see what kinds of things can we re do to reduce that. We also need to look at what we can do to conserve, conserve water, conserve energy in our operations. This model, Dr. Mary Fertig, uh, who's out of the Sustainability Leadership Institute, developed this, and I think it provides some good guidance for us as we move into a role of being sustainable leaders and how we might approach that. Probably the first step is the hardest step as it is with many things and that is that taking responsibility for our actions. So taking responsibility for what we're doing and then assuming leadership to work with others to try and change their behaviors. It's important to look at this whole issue in a very holistic way. Now those of you that are currently students here uh, in the program, in the hospitality and dietetics program, and those of you that are graduates, uh, I think are well versed to do this because you've talked the systems model, you understand the importance of these interrelationships, and it's that kind of systems thinking that really needs to go on as we look at sustainability and look at ways that um, one piece is impacting another and what can we do to lead that change. We need to convene conversations around the topic of sustainability with all of the players. It needs to include our suppliers, our customers, our employees. It needs to include those whose views are very different than your own because it isn't until we bring diverse groups together that we really can come to what are some breakthrough sort of ideas that we can use to make it better. Anytime you bring, though, diverse groups together, you're going to have creative tension. And so you need to not be afraid to have some of that tension. You need to learn to work through that with people to help get the ideas on the table to explore what are some of the um, opportunities. One of the things that she recommends that, that I think is so true is that it's important to work with people, to work with coming up with ideas, but not try to dictate. Um, all of us tend to push back naturally if someone says, do this. And, and that's what you'll find with your employees. That's what you'll find with your customers. It comes much better if we can experiment, learn, adapt together. And that's really a much stronger approach to take. Of course, all of that means that you need to have a better understanding of sort of the social dynamic of what goes on in change. I think many of you have taken a psychology class as part of what you're doing. You've probably had some org behavior classes talking about what does it take to actually change people's behaviors. And it's use of those techniques that will be important as we lead sustainability change. 
We need to try things. We need to be willing to risk, to experiment, to adjust as we go along. Because in doing that, we will expand the social conscious. What we know now is that, and probably it's the same in this audience, there's probably 20 to 25% of you who are really committed to sustainable actions and to moving us forward in that way. And then we have a large group that are actually sort of in the middle, yeah, it's kind of important, and if, if it's convenient, I might do something. And our goal as leaders really needs to be to help move that middle group much more towards um, the actions that we think are needed in order to help preserve the environment. So let me share a few resources that you might find helpful. In the healthcare industry, there are a couple organizations I would just mention. Healthcare Without Harm is a group that was started in 1996. They're an international coalition of hospitals. They have several different pledges around various aspects within the hospital, one of those being a healthy food pledge. So if you hear about the healthy food pledge, that's actually part of the work with Healthcare Without Harm. They also um, designed the Green Guide for Healthcare. And this is actually a, a manuscript that they worked on with the um, Center for Maximum Potential Building Systems that has a guide similar to LEAD actually, but talks about it specifically to healthcare and what kinds of things do we need to do within healthcare uh, organizations to create a greener environment. The second group is Practice Green Health. Practice Green Health um, was formed as a sort of independent organization just fairly recently, I think it was 2006. They actually were initially formed in 1998 as a memorandum of agreement between uh, the American Hospital Association and the um, EPA in trying to look at ways that we could reduce the kind of waste that went on in hospitals. But they've since gone on to become an independent group and they have a lot of sustainability pieces that are helpful for hospital uh, managers in, in all different areas, food service included. They have a sustainability dashboard, they have mentors that you can work with, and they also allow the opportunity to do benchmarking with similar organizations across the country. The National Restaurant Association launched their Conserve Sustainability Education Program several years ago and offer the opportunity for restaurant tours to both learn about and to have one-on-one -on -one consulting about sustainability. The Green Restaurant Association is a not-for-profit group that um, focuses entirely on green restaurants and the kinds of things that need to go on within restaurants. They developed as well a standard system for evaluating the, the greenness, as it were, of restaurants and offer certification. Theirs is in stars, and so I think they have two, three, and four stars. Their certification includes many things that are really specific to the restaurant industry related to food, chemicals, some of the types of things that you wouldn't see in a LEED certification, for example, that are more pertinent to a food service operation. NACUFS, the National Association of College and University Food Service, has developed their sustainability guide. They actually uh, recognize members each year with sustainability awards. And the American Hotel and Lodging Association uh, offers one-on-one -on -one consulting with what they call the green gurus in the profession, those who have uh, implemented a lot of sustainability practices. And then they uh, published what they call the green guidelines that provide guidance for, for lodging operators around sustainability. So in summary then, I'm hoping that uh, you've learned a little bit more, at least one thing maybe new that you didn't know before you came today. And I would ask that you leave uh, being much more committed to trying to incorporate more sustainability practices in your own life and in daily operations. For those of you that are currently working in food service and lodging operations, those of you that are aspiring to work in those, to be looking at that. That you practice reduce, re reuse, and recycle. Look at ways that you can better preserve our natural capital. Engage others. Improving sustainability in the United States will not happen um, by individual individuals alone, but it will happen by us working together to do this. So engage others in the process. 
and then commit to becoming a leader in this area in providing the leadership needed to change our operations. I would end with this quote. Dr. Whitehair actually used this quote at a recent conference, and I thought it was so fitting, um, so I, I chose to use it as well. And it's a quote by Gandhi. We must be the change we want to see in the world. Thank you. Again, I appreciate being here. Maybe we have a minute or two for questions, or I'll be available afterwards. Are there some questions? Looks like you've answered all the questions. <laughs> Oh, yes. I've not done research on it, but there has been a fair amount written around the whole idea of carbon footprint and what that might look like in our operations. I've seen it done probably more on sort of plant manufacturing than it actually has been getting that related specifically to our operations. But, but no, I've not actually done research on it. But it is a, a right topic for that. If you're a graduate student looking for a project, that's a great project. I just recently read a book that is really kind of Yeah. Are there other questions? Well, I, Rebecca? So, are we to brush do anything about your computing environment standards as part of the heat project? Um, well, we do, I mean, our, um, I, I, I don't know that I've ever, I don't know that I've seen a written sustainability plan around it, but our contract with our uh, computer provider includes the fact that they need to take, they need to recycle what we need. And then we have also worked with the company that we do all of our paper shredding with also takes all of our um, discs and will both destroy those and then recycle those. So I know we have those practices in place. I don't know if there's other particular things that you all have done that, but, but yes, that, that issue of they're, they're not to get thrown, just thrown in the, in, you know, to go to the landfill, they actually get taken back by the company that we contract with to be repurposed and, and reused as possible or recycled, the component parts recycled as needed. Yes? I have a question, question about, when you're talking about purchasing practices, is there a uh, cost tolerance for uh, organizations that they look to buy so they seem less efficiently than how they're produced traditionally? I think it, um, I don't know that there's necessarily, I could say, here's what the tolerance is, but I think what we do is we try to look at, if it's important to us, how do we make it happen? So for example, when we shifted from styrofoam to the compostable wear, there's a major cost difference. I think at the time it cost us less than a penny uh, for a cup, um, coffee cup, and it was costing us 10 or 15 cents for a compostable cup. But what we did is just pass that that on to the consumer, so we were recapturing it, so from a bottom line perspective, we captured that cost. You know, we really look at, now I've not done, um, I've not been willing to take on sort of the liability with going directly to local growers and getting from the local growers brought into the hospital, but we've really worked with our major food vendors to be doing that local purchasing so we can purchase in season local, so then, when it's in season, we'll specify that we want lettuce that's come from us regionally, not from California, for example, so that we'll pull those local products in and then you know, showcase the fact that that's what we're using. So I think there's ways you, you work to make that happen within a budget. So it takes, I think, though, being committed to, you know, sort of to do that, that, that is probably a lot of it. One of my questions is about health care and what, you know, like when we look, we can look at the food service part, but when we look at the patient care areas, what have been done to reduce waste there? So more disposable, but we also have a concern of contamination. 
uh, how they address that. Well, you know, we're looking actually, it's interesting because we're sort of coming full circle again, you know, in operating rooms, for example, we kind of moved totally away from reusables and we're now coming back to um, reassessing the use of um, surgical drapes that can be taken, clean, sanitized, and brought back in and used again. Same way with instrumentation and looking at ways that some of that can get pulled back. So I think there's more and more efforts being made to either say, can we recycle this? You know, the, I think the bottom line for us is to say, you know, we don't want it ultimately ending up at the landfill. So what can we do to prevent that, either from things that get repurposed and reused, or things that can either be composted or recycled in some way so that we prevent it from ending up in the landfill altogether. So I think you're seeing more efforts looking at some of those things um, in hospitals. At least we are. Well, I would like to thank Dr. Gregoire for her very interesting presentation. I think she challenged us both as professionals to look at how we can be more sustainable, and then some lessons that we can use as individuals to do that as well. So thank you very, very much. And then we'd like to present a small token of our appreciation for her coming. This is a, uh, a, a glass plaque that designates that she was the 39th Schugert lecturer. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. I think Dr. Gregoire will be around for a little while afterwards if you'd like to visit with her. And we'll see you next year for the 40th Schugert Lecture. Thank you. Very Isn't good. that good?